It's a great pleasure to welcome Kurt Campbell, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, back to the Kennedy School where he taught for a number of years. Kurt, welcome. Thank you, Nick. It's great to be back here. Um, a lot of us have been watching the Obama administration's policy towards East Asia and have been impressed because the President and Secretary of State, you, have given a lot more priority and attention to our alliance system, to our relationship with China. What's been your overarching goal over the last two years? Well, thanks for the opportunity, Nick. Let me just say, clearly, we're engaged uh, in monumental developments in the Middle East, uh, and it's incredibly important for the United States to be successful there. But I think there's a deeper and broader recognition that for the United States to be successful globally in the 21st century, we must sustain, prevail, and engage deeply in the Asian Pacific region. And so our desire is to engage across the board with all of our partners, uh, all the key actors, diplomatically, militarily, economically, demonstrating that we're open, engaged, prepared for the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. And I think we're up to the challenge. One of the, of course, one of the big issues, maybe the most important question facing American foreign policy for the next several dec decades is how do we work with China? We know that in a globalized 21st century we have to engage with China and work with them every day. We also know that China's military buildup poses a threat to the United States' position in East Asia and perhaps globally. How do you balance and reconcile those two competing objectives? Well, the most important thing to keep in mind when you're contemplating strategy uh, for China is to recognize deeply that it's not going to be easy and it's going to get harder. Um, that perseverance uh, has its rewards, that making uh, consistently an appeal for why the United States and China can work together on critical issues like North Korea, like Iran, like climate change, like uh, balancing uh, the global economy, that this is in the best interests of both of our countries. The truth is that history is littered with bad examples of rising states and established states in terms of trying to figure out how to work together. And we need to uh, learn those lessons from the past and be sure not to repeat them. The one thing that we have done consistently across both administrations, Republican and Democratic, is that we have accorded China a degree of respect and engagement in the international system that's unparalleled. Mm -hmm. And what has often been missing in these hegemonic transitions historically is that rising states like Germany in the 1920s felt that they were not treated with the respect, that they did not have a stake in the global system. China has been given that stake, and so they do not have the anxieties of the aggrieved uh, in terms of their global role. No country today plays as large a role on the global stage, one could argue, as China even in respect to the United States in some circumstances. And one of the acute difficulties in the U.S.-China relationship has been, since 1994, North Korea. We've gone through periods where we and the Chinese have worked relatively well together. How about now, and, and, and what is, how can we work with China to contain this threat mm -hmm. from, from North Korea? You're absolutely right that one of the key features of diplomacy towards North Korea when we were successful in the six-party framework and elsewhere has been the ability of Beijing and Washington to find common cause. I must say that that has been more challenging in the current environment and that one of the most important, indeed overriding aspects of American po uh, foreign policy is to convince China that standing by North Korea and giving them a blank check for their provocative actions is not in their interests, not in our interests, and runs the risk of destabilizing the entire uh, region. We're hopeful, after the successful WHO Obama summit in Washington, that China and the United States are beginning to find the common cause that's going to be necessary to maintain peace and stability and to develop consequential diplomacy towards North Korea. Thank you. You, you work in the State Department. You're our chief American diplomat on a daily basis focused on Asia. Um, since 9-11, the United States has often led with its military power and had diplomacy back up the military. It seems to a lot of us now that we've got to reverse that, that we have to see the return of diplomacy, that diplomacy needs to be the first response of the United States with the military backing it. How do you find that in Asia? Are we well positioned? Do we have sufficient number of people in the field? Do you have the resources you need to succeed in what is, without any question, the most vital part of the world for our country? I would say it's fair to say that over the course of the last several years, first beginning with Secretary Powell, who made, I think, uh, critical investments mm -hmm. in 
our foreign uh, policy apparatus. Uh, and, and I think most uh, uh, recently with Secretary Clinton, who has made it her mission to increase resources, we were beginning to see the kinds of remedial steps in terms of recruiting the right people, making sure that we are better positioned in the Asian Pacific region, and applying uh, aid and assistance towards development and uh, dealing with problems like climate change and the like. I must say, uh, in the current political context in Washington, all that is held at risk. And what we have is a dynamic now where basically most military issues uh, and spending is off the table, where uh, everything else, including the, the diplomatic budget, which is uh, a rounding error in many respects compared to our military budgets, is being slashed uh, unceremoniously. I think it's, it's deeply worrisome, and it will not serve American strategic interests. And we try to make this case daily in our interactions up on Capitol Hill. I'm hopeful that cooler heads will prevail and there will be a recognition that for us to be successful on the global stage means that we need to have good diplomats and that foreign policy is the best defense overall. Thank you. A final quick question. What did you take away from your experience at the Kennedy School that has helped you in your current position in Washington? Um, uh, I spent uh, about seven years here. I was a fellow, a lecturer, and then an associate professor. I learned an enormous amount from my colleagues, uh, from the fellows who were here, and uh, especially from the students. I found the mid-career programs to be the most challenging educational opportunities, largely for me. I learned more than the students <laughs> did. And you couldn't afford but to come to class with your A game. Overall, I think what the Kennedy School helped me to understand was that if you're going to be successful in anything you do, you have to be strategic. Mm -hmm. And you are uh, constantly confronted with people who are tactical, whether it be in government or in business mm -hmm. or in life. And to be effective uh, uh, in understanding problems, in devising solutions, and implementing strategies forward. A strategic approach is essential, and I think the Kennedy School helped me at least a little bit. I hope it did uh, in my current endeavors. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, for Nick. visiting us. Honor, honor to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you.